not always necessarily even find the solution, but find the name of it. Correct. Right. So if they had not had the OCD program, no one's even aware of it. But once you establish it, other parents can say, oh, I can recognize that. Yeah. And we have to shout out about it to get the word out. There's no question in my mind, you have to let people know what's happening. And there's so many wonderful developments. You know, in the autism world, there's a very well-known saying that meeting one child or person with autism is meeting, meeting one child or person with autism. And it's so true. Every single neurodivergent individual is unique and different with their own capabilities and needs and strengths. And we want to focus on the strength. So, uh, there's a movement in autism now among many allies and advocates, me included, to no longer use the term, for example, autism spectrum disorder. We instead just use autism. We say autistic individuals. We want to focus on those strengths and we want to emphasize that differences in brain functioning are not deficits necessarily. So you'll see a lot more advocacy now, both by parents, professionals, but also by neurodivergent individuals themselves. It's really breathtaking to see. Something you mentioned way kind of earlier, but the, some of the signs you started seeing in your children. Mm -hmm. And I know, again, these are going to be case by case because every individual um, just has different things. So it's going to be looking different. Are there certain things that you really recognize that you think might be helpful for parents to hear. So if they're thinking about it or unsure, because I think some of the things at first could be seen as just toddler behavior, right? Mm -hmm. The hyperactivity, not always listening, you're right. You, you can be like toddlers being toddlers. Um, so maybe some of the things that people could start paying attention to yeah, um, of course, this is a huge world. The first insight in my book is trust your gut as a parent. Just what we were talking about. I truly, you know, you know your children better than anyone else. If you think something is seriously wrong with your child, it generally is. Of course, you have to listen to your doctor and parenting experts and others. But if what they say doesn't resonate with you, get a second opinion or a third opinion. So generally the guideline I recommend is that if behavior, even at very young ages, is distressing to you or your child, reach out. And if you don't know where to start, because I remember, how do you start it? Where do you go? What do you turn? Find other parents, call associations, call support groups, even if you're not sure, and I'm gonna give an example, that your child fits in one of these. Talk to those parents, because there is so much you know, uniqueness and variability. There are certainly certain neurodevelopmental markers that are clear. The first parent support group that David and I went to before the kids were diagnosed were for parents of kids with ADHD. And the kids at the time were maybe four and six. And it was great. We found all these parents who had kids who were hyperactive, impulsive, distracted. But when we started asking about, what about all these tics, these vocal and physical motor tics? What about these long meltdowns? What about this difficulty? They looked at us like we were from the, you know, a, a different planet. Because they haven't seen that. They only met, right. right. So we knew, we, we were pretty sure that ADHD was there based on what we saw, but we said there's something else. And it was only later when David, months later, David happened to be researching Tourette syndrome. Mm -hmm. And he saw the words rage or meltdown associated with emotional overload. And we went running to our nearest Tourette Canada support group. And that's where we found a home that really understood many of the behaviors. Not autism, as many people with Tourette go to university and have very senior careers. Many people with autism do too. But in terms of Andrew, he also has intellectual um, and cognitive limitations. So again, it's just a lot of trial and error. It's being a dog with a bone. Um, another insight in the book is to embrace research. And research is so important, as we know, 
to help us find the right resources. So it's whether it's the support groups or books or, you know, I called when we were looking for the right doctors, psychiatrists and psychologists, 10, 20 hospitals and professionals until I kept hearing the same name. Mm, okay. uh, and then that's how I found the original pediatric neuropsychopharmacologist that we used. Mm. It was in Boston, by the way, at Mass General Hospital. No, a wonderful, wonderful department there. Um, but you just have to keep digging. Of course, parents take breathers on research too, because the law of diminishing returns comes in and you have to know when to take a breath, but you never completely stop. And to this day, I don't stop. There are always new findings, new treatments. Right. New, and this world is exploding with exciting advances. Uh, and the inter <laughs> okay, go ahead. I, I just wanted to mention something I struggle with, which is the opposite of what I mentioned before, you know, if we're talking about how there was a lack, you know, less information earlier, sometimes I struggle with the amount of information we do have now. Because there's like an overload of information and there's uh, so many contradicting sites. And then now also, you know, we have the artificial intelligence writing as well. And then we get into some of the financial things, you know, the blog, some articles, people are including them to include the link so they can get paid. And so, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, it's like, essentially, you can find the truth and the answer on the internet, right? Because it's just this vast ocean of information. So it's out there. And, but sometimes, because I, I was trying to find something within, for a conversation I had with a friend, you know, she was asking certain behaviors. And so we were talking about like, well, let's take a look what if it's this or that is a toddler behavior or is it something and i found information on both sides so once i said hey if you are, are seeing these behavioral um you know things it's definitely it and then when i was like well let me just check it and i said what are not the signs it was almost similar stuff in really persuading it the other way and i know the answer is like you know let's do more research who is the more credible but I think at that level, it just becomes overwhelming, which I think maybe where the support group would be really helpful to find that group of people you really trust through recommendation. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. But also your doctors, your experts on the internet, right. it is a crucial source of research, but you must, must verify everything you read with experts. Let me give you two examples. Um, until the 1960s, long time ago, it used to be thought that unfeeling parenting and refrigerator mothers caused autism. That was commonly held belief. And then there was an American psychologist, Bernard Rimland, who challenged that and said, no, I think there might be some other biological factors and opened the world and ripped that band-aid because we know poor parenting is not a cause of autism. We know that genetics plays a major role. We know that in external environmental factors play major roles. But then you see certain celebrities and you read social media. Autism is caused by vaccines. Mm. You've probably heard that. There's no evidence. There was a small study in the UK in 1998 that claimed this was true, particularly the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. And unfortunately that was picked up again uh, and again in a number of studies. This study was found to be fraudulent and deeply flawed. Actually the physician that and the researcher that wrote it was lost his medical license. Mm. And we have so much evidence that vaccines don't cause autism and that vaccine ingredients are safe. They don't lead to autism. So you wanna get your child vaccinated. That's one example. ADHD, oh, your kid is lazy, right? They're not, they can't get anything done. They can't get organized. Um, you just need to be a stricter parent, as my mother said, right? right. It, it's your fault as a parent. And particularly mothers get blamed for this. And again, mm. it's just not true. So it's very difficult to weed through the information. 
You do your best, and that's all any of us can do. You talk to experts, you talk to other parents, but if it's a phase, it'll come and go, right? It may, sure. and I saw that when the kids were little, the ticking in particular. Uh, I remember Andrew at a holiday concert, I think he was in grade one, his eyes were going, his shoulders were shrugging. I called the doctor, always oh, just under holiday stress. And it mm. did go away for a while but then it came back. And so what you see is when you see patterns or when that distress lasts for longer than a couple of months when your child is very young, that's when you wanna seek help. Early intervention is very important and extremely helpful. And, you know, it really can make a difference in outcomes. Something I also wanted to discuss, you mentioned those partnerships that you have with the provider, with the doctor, with all of the parties really involved. So everyone has that you know, really solid communication between one another. Correct. Those groups you mentioned in the schools, were those already in place like no. with Andrew or is that something that you helped help start it or how did you go about it? No, a, a combination to be frank. So in Ainsley's case, um, I spoke to the principal and I said, let's instigate because she was out of control, right? And we were all trying to figure out what to do. Let's instigate these monthly group meetings and bring in Ainsley's external psychologist who really is working well with her. Uh, and then we were able to start planning. Didn't always work, but she was able to stay in school and then get, gain more and more control. In Andrew's case, his school because he, again, he was in a specialized class, right? They sent notes home already every night and we sent them back and it, very, very helpful. So I talked about those nine months of almost daily meltdowns. You can yeah. imagine how I was really functioning. And then I found a new developmental pediatrician, Lily, who prescribed a 